the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit of one God. Amen. So, hello. Um, Sarah and I prepared a talk um, about defending Christianity before our Muslim brothers. Um, now, before we start, I do not want you to think that this is an attacking um, talk, because that is not what we're here for. We are here to defend the faith. But we do need to know some things about the other faith, like Patrick was saying yesterday. Um, when we are, when we, like, we need to know who we're talking to and what they can comprehend and what they can't. Okay. And the reason I mentioned our Muslim brothers is because we often, like, I feel like in our culture and society, we give them a very hard time, and that we have to remember that they are each created in the image of God just like us and that we can actually learn so much from them like they have so much zeal so much everything like and they they are going out to expand their faith so let's let's like start looking at the positives okay not that we should convert or anything <laughs> um, okay so just starting does anybody know what the word for is what islam or islam means Peace. Give up. Peace. Yes. Submission. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. So it's the Arabic word for surrender. Um, and it, it does refer to the sort of the peace that comes from when you surrender yourself to God, basically. Um, just a little bit of background about how it came about is that they believe that in the seventh century, Angel Gabriel appeared to Muhammad and who was illiterate. Um, and he dictated the Quran, um, which was revealed to him by Allah, God, um, and <laughs> to a scribe, okay, because he was illiterate. So like what we were saying is um, that, mis that Islam is actually is growing. It's like the fastest growing religion in the world. Uh, currently it's about 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. Um, but we're still ahead with 2.18 <laughs> 2 um, billion Christians. That's about the third of the world, but it's declining. Okay? And, it, and Islam is, is increasing. So that's a bit, uh, it's not great on our part. But okay, just to understand who we're talking to, they do believe in one God. Um, they have five pillars of Islam, you've probably heard about these. Um, Shahada is somebody has to be able to recite um, that there is no God but Allah. It has to be with, with, they have to say it but also believe it. Um, so there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. Salah, prayer, you know these words in Arabic, um, five times a day. Za'ed? I don't know. Hmm? Zakat. Oh, right, so. um, that's just, that's Allah's giving, you have to, which you have to give. And so fasting, we all know about Ramadan, and it's that nothing will enter the lips. Um, and it's only for able-bodied Muslims. So for people who are ill, kind of like we have that, me, I a Buddha, um, that can sort of let us do certain things in our fast and eat certain things, that for those who are not able, same, same sort of thing. And then the Hajj, um, the pilgrimage to Mecca. Um, and that's where Angel Gabriel is said to have revealed the Quran and they used to be able to do it in their lifetime. Sorry, this is the last slide about background. Um, there are Shia and Sunni Muslims, which you may have heard about. Um, Sunni is the greatest majority, it's with 80%. Um, but Shia, well, the difference is, the main difference is that they believe that Islam was passed through Muhammad's bloodline. Okay, so Ali was Muhammad's cousin and he was like the next of kin and he just passed it down. Um, whereas the Sunnis believe that he, there was no sort of, um, no one was appointed. So Abu Bakr, I don't know how you pronounce it, was his best friend and so he, he was elected to take him on. Okay? Thank you. Um, and then some are just in either category. You, God believe that they, you know that they believe in a God, in one God. So when we are talking to them, we can. There are certain things we can say. We're not we're not discussing with people that don't know God. Um, so we just wanted to talk about the problems that some most Muslims may have with Christianity. Okay.
okay? What? The picture. Okay, so there are five main areas which um, they have trouble with. We are going to hopefully tackle four because there is just no time to tackle five. And with God's grace, I will attempt to explain. Yeah? Can you also explain the picture? Um, when you go to Christian and Muslim, few images come up. Why are they winking? They're like they're watching each other. Oh, um, they're meant to be praying, close their eyes, but they're looking. Yeah. They're not winking. Yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, okay, so we said that they, they believe in one God, yeah? And that's like a core thing in Islam, as it is in Brazil. Um, but they have a problem with our trinity. So, in the Quran, um, there is a verse that says, God is not a father, and he is not a son. So when we start talking about God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they're like, this is polytheistic, and it, to them it's blasphemy, okay? They, and they almost think that we've invented the Trinity um, to be able to call ourselves worshipping one God, monotheists, but actually um, worshipping three gods. Um, a main issue that they have is that the biological sonship. So when they say, when they, when we, they refer to someone as the son, as we all do, we um, understand them to be a biological offspring. So they are created, meaning Jesus must be inferior. But um, we know that's not right. Um, <laughs> I'm going to read you something that I found um, to do with the original Hebrew. Yeah, we'll read Okay, so the trouble is with the English translation of begotten, okay? Because for us, that can still mean created. So you have to go back to, to the Hebrew, um, sorry, Greek, which is monogenes. Monogamies. Oh, the oh, monogamies. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, anyways, so what does that mean? So there's two primary definitions, and the, the, the main thing is that they both have in common. It means it's pertaining to being the only one of its kind, right? So it's set apart with a specific relationship. Um, so similar to when they when God refers to Isaac's son, uh, sorry, Isaac as the son of Abraham, he was the begotten son. He had another son, but he was the one of his kind because he was from Sarah, yeah? Um, same, second definition is basically like the first. So a unique, someone unique, okay? So we're not talking about created. Or like, it doesn't, that's not what the word in Hebrew means. In Greek, sorry, means. Okay, so we're gonna attempt to describe the Trinity by a, an example uh, we've seen in chemistry and physics is the atom, okay? So for example, in a molecule of water, there are three separate, is it atoms? Um, <laughs> but um, they are, they all, you cannot set, you're not, they're all involved, but in one entity. H2O. Does that make sense? Yes? Like this. Um, could somebody read this out for me? This was a quote from the book, which I didn't explain, I apologise. Um, Sarah read um, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus um, by Dr. Nabib Qureshi. And this is a quote from his book. Maria, could you read that? Okay. There are many things in this world that can be three in one. So why not God? Science shows that there are things in this world so tiny that we can only view them, view them through microscopes, and yet they are incomprehensibly complex. The world is so complex that it baffles our minds. What about the one who created the world? The one who created our minds? I now think that if my creator is so simple that I can understand him, perhaps I have made him in my image. Mm -hmm. 
that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, nonetheless, we will attempt to um, explain him. But what I what we just wanted to get at with this is that, like, forgive me, but I'm still trying to comprehend. Yeah. And we, I won't. I don't believe that I'm going to fully get there. So um, bear with me when I'm trying to explain the Trinity. Um, so we believe God is one being and three persons. Can anybody read Genesis one twenty six? We change three persons, three high persons. Yeah, I'm coming. I was, yeah, I was coming to that. What do you want? Um, Genesis one twenty six. Um, then God said, "Let us make man." Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Thank you. So he says, we and our, okay? Um, Abuna mentioned to me. So we can see from the beginning that he's, there is, there is, diff, there are, more than one is existing, right? Person or hypostasis will come to that. Um, and the reason we know that he's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is because he, that's the way he revealed to himself to us, okay, in those three different hypostases. So he is one being with three hypostases. So the one issue essence, again. One essence, three hypostases. Yeah. So the issue again is with our English translation person. What's more accurate is um, the Greek term hypostasis. And that means <laughs> under hypo or low, yeah, stasis, which means being. So it's like three things under his being, under one being. That kind of makes sense. Okay. Um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the Father is the origin. The Son is born forth from the Father, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. So we can we can mention these with like analogies which we've come across before. So, if, but analogies don't always you know they're limited. But for example, the fire. The fire is the fire. God. Father brings forth light, brings forth heat. You can't separate them, they all come at the same time. So Jesus was not created or coming after because in 1 John it says, in John 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, he is the Logos, though. Jesus is the Logos, He is the logic. So it's what we can comprehend. Of, of God, okay? It's the wisdom, he's the wisdom of God, or the mind of God. There is um, a term which the, a theological term called perichoresis, um, which many of the church fathers mention and refer to, and it, it kind of, it means a divine dance, okay? And so you've got the, um, when referring to love, or having a relationship of love, you must have more than one hypostasis. <laughs> okay? So, they describe the Trinity as almost, picture a triangle, like, a, like full of energy um, going around, and that is just this loving relationship, okay? And when Christ, when God created us, he created us not to worship him only, but to partake in this relationship of love with him and with the body of the church, okay? Um, if somebody could read the next slide, because I think it puts it a little bit simpler, hopefully. Green. The theologians in the early church tried to describe this wonderful reality that we call Trinity. If any of you have ever seen, ever been to a Greek wedding, you may have seen their distinctive way of dancing. 
It's called perichoresis. There are not two dancers, but at least three. They start to go in circles, weaving in and out in this very beautiful pattern of motion. They start to go faster and faster and faster, all the while staying in perfect rhythm and in sync with each other. Eventually, they are dancing so quickly, yet so effortlessly, that as you look at them, it just becomes a blur. Their individual identities are part of a larger dance. The early church fathers and the <coughs> looked at that dance, perichoresis, and said, that's what the Trinity is like. It's a harmonious set of relationship in which there's mutual giving and receiving. This relationship is called love, and it's what the Trinity is all about. The perichoresis the is a dance of love. As human beings relate to one another in the, in the dance of life in this, on this planet, the relationships between the three persons of the Trinity, dynamic, interactive, loving, serving, form the model for our human dance steps. Unfortunately, through sinfulness, we corrupt the dance into a choreography of conflict. However, now through the gospel, Christians have been brought into a special relationship with the triune God. Through Christ's incarnation, ministry, death, resurrection, and ascension, and by the regenerating action of the Spirit, we prodigals have been brought home and embraced by our Father. Gathered into the household of faith, we now enjoy the feast of the fattened calf and participate in the dance party that is taking place in the Father's house. In this way, we exemplify the reality and nature of God and bring his good news to a world that has forgotten how to dance. Um, we also wanted to sing at the end of the song that, you know, at school we used to sing, I am the Lord of the Dance, said he that way. So it kind of clicked to us when we were doing this that, hold on a sec, maybe this is what they're referring to. So we got that for the end. Um, but, um, yeah, I thought I'd just mention it so you don't know, so you don't get confused. Okay, so moving on. Um, it's just a couple of verses that people have, that the people will raise. And just, a, just before we, like, dissect it, um, there's something we need to understand about how the Quran was delivered, is that it was deli delivered with, like, five verses at a time, they believe that were revealed, okay? And so, for them, it's okay for them to pick out verses in our Bible, because for, you, for the Quran, you can do that, because they don't all link, okay, and they don't claim to. But for us, that's not, that's not possible, because the way books were written in the Bible, so for example, in the, book, uh, the Gospel according to St. John, um, it's, it's uh, all supposed to be interpreted with his introduction, okay? Um, and chapters, verses were only put in later for our reference. It's not how they were written. Okay, so one, we've probably come across these verses before, but just to make sure we're on the same page. Um, when Christ says, my father is greater than I. So we need to dissect, when was, it, when was he saying this? We can't just take it out of context. He was saying this to preparing his disciples just before he was going to be betrayed just before he was going to be spat on, just before he was going to be scourged and humiliated, okay? And we read in Philippians that he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Christ says that if you loved me, you would rejoice because I'm going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Yeah? What he's saying is, is that he's going to my, his glory that he sort of it covered um, during his incarnation. Okay? So he's referring to, uh, to his Father's glory because he emptied himself. Okay? He emptied himself. Um, of his glory, okay? And that's what he's referring to. He's, re he's mentioning it in his human form, okay? Okay, we also get that the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. We believe that the father, the different hypostases have different functions. A key function of the Father, which the other two do not have, is that he is the source. Okay? Um, 
And again, with all of this, Christ is, refer is speaking in his humanity. Yeah? Um, another, thing, another verse that is raised up is when the disciples are questioning him about the end of days and what, who will know the hour and everything. And he says, but of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Does anybody have any ideas about this verse? He might have been being diplomatic and simply saying, I'm not telling you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? It is like when you ask uh, an examiner during the, the exam, <laughs> what is the solution of this answer, question? I don't know. Yeah? Any others? No? Okay, well there are plenty of examples in the Bible where God sort of doesn't cover his knowledge so much as he, he engages with us at our level. Otherwise, what's the point in talking to God? He knows our thoughts. He knows everything about us. If you're having a conversation with him about your day, he doesn't he know what happened? But he so often, he would ask, he asked Adam when he sinned. He said, where are you when he was hiding? He said, who told you that you were naked? Yeah, he knew. But he, he's asking and he gives us the chance to relate to him. And he asked him, have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you? He asked Cain. He said, where is your brother Abel? He asked Lazarus about Lazarus, where have you laid him? He's asked so many questions, which, if we question this, it's because Christ appeared to us in a form that we can understand, and he interacted with us how we interact with each other. Okay, so he came to us as man. He's going to interact to us with us as man. Yeah? Um, and so when so when he says um, about those who are perishing and, and that they will come at the last day, and he'll say, "I never knew you." Does that mean that he doesn't know? Like didn't he didn't know them? Like, no. Yeah, no. Um, but it, it's almost that he's saying he doesn't, there's two things. Almost you do not deserve my knowledge of you. But it's more so that as well that the intimate knowledge, okay? The, the vulnerability before each other. If we don't have that relationship with Christ, uh, with God in, in our lives, if he doesn't know us in, in intimacy, then no, he never did know us really. Yeah? Um, so why, yeah, so um, Charles, you were saying that maybe he just sort of, just to quieten them down from being diplomatic, um, he might have just been saying to stop the questions, but, um, but from the exa different examples that we've seen, it's, it, it's not, that can't be the only explanation. Um, also, the verse actually says, I was kind of mistaken because I understood the verse to actually say, I do not know, not even I know the hour. But that's not actually what it says. No, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, you're right. Yeah, that's not what the verse says. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> he says, take heed, watch and pray, but you do not know when the time, time is. He never says, I don't. So you'll find that with a lot of these things, is that we, this is why we need to know our Bible. And like, we need to know our faith. People come and ask us things in confidence, okay? And that we don't need to shy away. We just need to know what's, what's right. Because a lot of the, the questions and things that people raise are just, are not grounded on anything, okay? Um, so don't be afraid to just be like, well, it's not what it says. There is another explanation which can be a bit complicated, but I'll try to say it, yes. right? that Jesus in his earthly ministry did not use his theology for his own benefit. Okay. So that was part of him emptying himself. Mm -hmm. He emptied himself from the theology for his own glory. He only used, used his, theo his theology or his, his God powers 
for the benefit of the mission and others. Mm -hmm. So in this case, he did not boast that he knows because it would benefit him. So he said, no, I'm not here to tell mm -hmm. And as human, I should not know. Mm -hmm. But it, it is verse 32, it says the sun will know. Mm -hmm. So whatever you make of that, that's what, that's what the actual words are. Mm -hmm. And that's in his humanity. Mm -hmm. Sorry? And is that in his humanity? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm just giving you a possible reason. I mean, you're, you're living into that. Yeah, not me. <laughs> I'm just giving you a reason. <laughs> <laughs> but there will be, you know, we can't pretend that text isn't there. That's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. It's not an invention of Muslims, it's there in the Bible. Okay. Yeah, change the slide. Um, they have a massive problem with St. Paul. Yes. They really dislike this guy. <laughs> um, but it's not rooted. The Quran teaches Muslims to revere Jesus and his disciples. Because um, they were the people that were chosen by God to spread his true message, including the fact that Jesus was just a human. Um, they believe that that wasn't the aim of what Jesus' ministry was, but it became, the people made it about him. That he was a prophet, bringing people to Allah, God, um, and, but then people made it about worshipping Jesus, which was to them blasphemy. And they believe that this wasn't particularly spread by St. Paul. Um, they, they thought that this was his motives were power and authority, but when we really look at it, that's not grounded because St. Paul risked his life numerous times. Um, he was humiliated. I don't know what kind of power or authority he was looking at for, if, if that's the case. Um, he was the top rabbi of his time, but he actually sort of dismissed that, he got rid of that, and he went the total opposite direction. He, he didn't, wasn't after, after power and authority, because if you look at his life, it was a life of meekness and of poverty, and sort of distress, <coughs> like, seriously, seriously <laughs> bad tortures. Um, they also deny Christ's um, death on a cross. There are two theories that they use to explain it. One is the swoon theory and one is the substitution theory. The swoon theory says that if God can raise Jesus from the dead, if we claim that God can raise Jesus from the dead, why can't he do a smaller miracle which says, well, keep him alive on the cross? Okay? They say he didn't really die on the cross, he just came very close to it, and that he was taken down and laid in a tomb after three days, the coolness of the tomb revived him, <laughs> and he managed to roll away the stone, come out of the tomb, and appear to his disciples. That's the swoon theory. The second, the substitution theory, um, which most Muslims will argue, is that Jesus was substituted. So he was put on the, like, his face was put on somebody else to die, okay? So, what if Jesus was just like hiding somewhere? Actually, the, 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 the second one is the, 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 the truth. Yeah, this is the one that most people It means like they, 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 people <laughs> know it, he's dead, but actually who died was in Jesus. Yeah, they claim it was Judas. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The second theory, I, 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 this is the first time I, I hear about the first theory, but the second theory, it's very common in Egypt, yeah. and it is like the main one. Yeah. yeah, and you're right, Judas is the Judas, most, yeah. most you know, common thing. You know what is the second theory? The, the second theory is, it says, when, when Judas went to Gethsemane, yeah, he kissed the Lord. Is that right? 
when he kissed the Lord, he touched his body. So the act of there of our Lord Jesus Christ went to Judas. Yes? So Judas looked like Christ. And then the Lord disintegrated, disappeared from Gethsemane to another mountain, yeah? And was taken up to heaven from there. But when, you know, when the Jews asked the Lord, who are you? He said, I am Jesus Christ. They fell over on their faces, yeah? So when actually they got up, they found only Judas. With the ectoderm, of course, went into Judas' face, so he became like who? Christ. So they asked him, who are you? So he said, I am Judas. Oh no, you looked like Christ. But they couldn't find Christ. So they said, he is Christ. And kept Judas saying, I am Judas, I am Judas, I am Judas. They said, no, 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 you are Christ. So they took him, crucified him. And that is why it looks like uh, the Lord. Where did that come from? Like, why, why did that is one of the explanations that they, uh, they wanted to explain that Judas looked like Christ. How? Yeah? So they came to the explanation that the ectoderm went from the Lord to Judas' face, yeah, while he was kissing him. That's the explanation they say. Taban, yani, we don't say that is true, yeah. What about Judas' death? What did they say about Where? Judas, Judas killed himself. <coughs> Our Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> became like particles, went into another mountain, yeah? And the Lord took him from there. That is why they say the Lord hasn't died, hasn't crucified. Yeah? It's all trying to explain what is written, yeah? With different theories. It is a theory, and from... Okay, but what we want to say is that throughout history, like crucifixion was designed to be such a torturous death that no man could survive a full Roman crucifixion. Okay? Um, you know, you know how. Um, the Bible t teaches us that Christ got a um, spear in his side. Um, why did they do that? It's because it was getting late. They couldn't have them up um, when the Passover was going to happen. And they had to make sure that he was dead. Um, this, and so they did this by stabbing them with a spear straight into his heart, killing him. If he wasn't, if he wasn't dead before, he would have been. Okay? Um, yeah, so no scholar... Christian or not, denies that Jesus died death on the, like Jesus' death on the cross. Almost no one does. Um, most actually agree and can be assured, more assured of Jesus' death by crucifixion than anything, any other part of his life. Okay, when you look, when you look at scholars' teaching and, and like writings. Okay. Um, just wanted to kind of get you guys really understanding what it meant to be a Roman crucifixion or so um, we had like quite a bit. Sarah, do you want to read it? Oh, oh my oh, okay. Does anyone want to read it? Even the flogging process consisted 
of a whip that was designed to rip skin off the body and cause excessive bleeding. Like After a few lashes, the victim's skin would come off in ribbons and their muscles would tear. After a few more lashes, arteries and veins were laid bare. Sometimes the flagrum would reach around the patient's abdomen and their intestines would spill out. Many people would die from flogging alone. After flogging, victims were nailed through their arms to the cross. The nails right through the median nerve, causing excess, extreme pain and incapacitating hands. A seven inch nail would be driven through both feet. The crucifixions, the crucifixion victim would be made to hang from both arms, making it impossible to breathe, and any little remaining energy left would push against the nails of his feet so that he could breathe back down, then push up before breathing out again. This is why they broke the leg of the robbers next to Jesus, because they knew that without their knees they couldn't breathe out, so they died. <laughs> the, the crown was woven and then pressed around the head, ripping the skin of his scalp too. Blood loss is also an extreme thirst as the body craves water to restore the lost blood. Jesus said, I thirst. John 19, 28. A heart beats so hard trying to compensate for the loss of oxygen due to the lack of blood in the body that it eventually ruptures. They then pierce his heart to confirm his death. The disciples went from being afraid of associating with him to dying and proclaiming him. If Jesus had just barely survived the cross, he would have come to them broken on the verge of dying, not the kind of appearance that would inspire a total transformation and a lack of fear of death. Without the disciples' boldness, there would be no Christianity. Christian and non-Christian sources from the first century testify of Jesus' death on the cross. Virtually everyone believes that his death is in one of the shortest facts of history. So we just wanted to, like, <laughs> like medically. Have you heard? Bad. Have you heard what did she say? All of you. <laughs> okay. And I wanted her to say it on the microphone. Can we? No. <laughs> So we're sure Jesus died, okay? Um, so to go against the substitution theory, which is what's most commonly believed, the point is that it's a conjecture. It's, it's, <laughs> it doesn't stand on anything. It's just something they've used to try and not fall in their own, yeah? Well, yeah, we were trying to... Conjecture. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Guesswork. Yeah. yeah. Guesswork. Did you know? His claims are not evidence. Um, so it's not based on any evidence. It's not based on any truth. Um, to me, especially what Horna was saying about the, the change the that when Jesus kissed... Like, for me, that's kind of harder to believe. Um, <laughs> but anyways... You I'm know, sorry, I don't you know, know what that does mean? It still does mean that we believe it is Judas who have been risen. <laughs> <laughs> they put Judas on yeah. the cross yeah. and Judas died and we put uh, Judas in the tomb. So the one who has been risen would be Judas. I think it means yeah. something even worse than that. Take some it means that God is alive. Yeah, of but course. The, the trouble with this theory it only leaves us with only one conclusion, that God is a liar because he deceives all the people he believed in Jesus and his disciples for all those centuries till it dawned upon him 700 years later to tell us. It only leaves us with one conclusion. This God is a liar. Their God, the one who said that, not ours. There can be no other conclusion. Yeah. So we have no picture. <laughs> so it's just saying what if doesn't make it right. 
thinking. Um, so, sorry, forgive me, it's a very big topic, but we're almost getting to the end. Um, and yes, so the medical evidence, the eyewitness testimonies um, of his, his death and resurrection, and the emergence of the early church. So, there is no denying the fact that there was an empty tomb, because scholars testified to it, and also, um, if, if his body was left in the tomb, we would have heard about it. Yeah? Like, just think about it. Jewish authorities wouldn't have, wouldn't have just let that go silent. Yeah? So, we know his, the tomb was empty, because they even, which they testify to this day, that they testify that the, the, the disciples had stolen the body. But again, there's no proof of this. But what, what it does confirm is that the tomb was empty. Actually, what's funny about the disciples stealing the body is that a few days later, when the disciples went into the temple and did the miracle, and they told them not to preach the word of God, the, mm -hmm. the, the name of Christ again, they never interrogated them about stealing the body. Yeah, that's true. So they knew. Be and I, I think another answer for this uh, is that uh, if, if, if this theory is true, the Jews would have proved it. Mm -hmm. uh, the Jews say, uh, believe until now, that the disciples stole the body. So, they, uh, if, if, if it was a substitution and the, the Judah uh, 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 died on the cross instead of uh, Jesus Christ, so, so, so they all have said it, but they approved that he did, that he, he, was, the, he, he, he was crucified and he was yeah. dead on the cross, yeah. and then the body was stolen. And even more, Jesus was a very well known person in, in that time, so they, they can, couldn't have like, mistaken him or taken him by him, he was a known person. He used to teach uh, the temple all the time, so uh, it's like nonsense. Yeah. Um, so these are just some things that, through history, we can see that like proof of his resurrection. And just um, in terms of the disciples, so who was standing there at the cross when Jesus was being crucified? John. Mary. Yeah. Okay. So where were the rest of the disciples? Okay, so for me, this is a big thing, because if you see what the disciples did to the world after Christ's resurrection, how did they go from being these, forgive me, cowardly um, men to literally turning the entire world upside down? And then die for their belief. And then die for their belief. And then more than that, um, is it, St. Paul. So they say, some people say that through, they might have been in a psychological state where they um, were longing to see, that, you know, Christ was with them for so long and they, they laid so much trust on him that maybe it was a hallucination. But it doesn't really explain why he would appear to St. Paul. Um, and also the sheer number of people. It was like 500 people that he appeared to. Um, so something of this magnitude can't really be accounted for, for with, with that. Um, also, yeah, so why would it be recorded that the first to see the risen Christ were females, um, when females were sort of deemed um, inferior? It, this is just, yeah. <laughs> and then just other explanations and theories just require like, more like investigators and they just twist it and, 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 and they just ignore facts basically. Um, so um, this just basically puts things um, clearly more so than I would. Um, and it's, it's just um, against the claim that a lot of Muslims believe that the Bible is corrupt. Um, yeah, so it's just, it's just talking about how this is not possible, even in their faith, it cannot, it doesn't stand. But we'll. In Surah 29, verse 46, the Quran commands Muslims to say to Christians, We believe in what has been revealed to us and in what has been revealed to you. Our God and your God is one, and to Him we submit.
Yet many Muslims say something very different to Christians. They say, we don't believe in your book because it's been corrupted, and your God is a false God. If Muslims are commanded to say that they believe in what has been revealed to us, why do they instead say that they don't believe in the Bible, the only revelation we have? And if they're commanded to say that our God and their God is one, why do they instead say that our God is a false God? According to the Bible, God is a trinity, one in nature or essence, but three in person, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Son entered creation as Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus died on the cross for sins and rose from the dead. The Quran denies all of this, so a Muslim can't say that he believes in the Bible or that Allah and the God of the Bible are the same God. Muslims have to reject the Bible, because the Bible contradicts the Quran. But Muslims have a problem here. The Quran declares that the Torah and the Gospel were revealed by Allah. Surah 3 verses 3 through 4 He has revealed to you the book with truth, verifying that which is before it. And he revealed the Torah and the Gospel aforetime, a guidance for the people. And he sent the Quran. So Allah revealed the Torah and the Gospel as a guidance. But our Muslim friends tell us that Allah couldn't protect the Torah and the Gospel, and that both revelations were corrupted by men. What Allah sent to guide people ended up misguiding people, convincing Christians that God is a trinity and that Jesus died on the cross for sins. Of course, we should be puzzled when Muslims tell us that the Torah and the Gospel were changed, because the Quran states that no one can change Allah's words. Surah 18, verse 27 and recite what has been revealed to you of the book of your Lord. There is none who can change his words, and you shall not find any refuge besides him. Here our Muslim friends might say, this verse only means that no one can change the Quran. But the verse doesn't say that no one can change the Quran. It says that no one can change Allah's words. And the Torah and the Gospel, according to the Quran, are Allah's words. Despite Allah's clear declaration that no one can change his words, many Muslims assert that the gospel was corrupted by the Apostle Paul or by later Christians. If the gospel is corrupted, we can only wonder why the Quran says that Christians still had the gospel during the time of Muhammad. Surah 7 verse 157 Those who follow the messenger the unlettered prophet whom they find mentioned in their own scriptures, in the Torah and the Gospel. It is they who will prosper. How could Christians find Muhammad mentioned in the Gospel when the Gospel was supposedly corrupted centuries earlier? Is Allah saying that we find Muhammad mentioned in our corrupted scriptures? But we don't find Muhammad mentioned in our scriptures at all except as part of a general warning about false prophets who come to lead people away from the gospel. And if we did find Muhammad mentioned in our scriptures, how would we know that this wasn't one of the corrupted parts? And since our scriptures contradict Islam, why would Allah appeal to them as evidence for Islam? But Allah goes much further than this. He commands Christians to judge by the gospel. Surah 5 verse 47 let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. If any do fail to judge by the light of what Allah hath revealed, they are no better than those who rebel. Why does Allah command us to judge by a corrupt book? The only gospel we have contradicts Islam, so in order to obey Allah's command, we would have to judge by the gospel and conclude that Islam is false. Allah continues along these same lines in Surah 5, verse 68. Say, O people of the book, you have no ground to stand upon unless you stand fast by the Torah, the Gospel, and all the revelation that has come to you from your Lord. Why would Allah tell us that we have no ground to stand upon unless we stand upon a corrupt book? If the Gospel has been corrupted, wouldn't Allah just tell us to get rid of it and believe in the Quran? 
So the Quran clearly maintains that the gospel is authoritative for Christians, and this only makes sense if the author of the Quran believed that Christians have the word of God. But the gospel wasn't just authoritative for Christians, it was also authoritative for Muhammad himself, and therefore, for Muslims. One day, Muhammad started having doubts about his revelations. In response to these doubts, Allah commanded Muhammad to go to the people of the book, Jews and Christians, for confirmation. Surah 10, verse 94. But if you, O Muhammad, are in doubt as to what we have revealed to you, ask those who read the book before you. Certainly the truth has come to you from your Lord, therefore you should not be of the disputers. Muslims today act as if the Quran stands in judgment over the Bible. Since the Bible contradicts the Quran, Muslims assume that the Bible must be rejected. But in the Quran, it's exactly the opposite. The Bible stands in judgment over the Quran, and Muhammad himself could only confirm his revelations by checking to see if they line up with the scriptures of the people of the book. Since Muhammad continued preaching Islam, he apparently never took this test very seriously. If he had gone to the people of the book in search of confirmation, he would have been forced to reject the Quran, because the Quran puts Muslims in an inescapable dilemma. Either Christians have the inspired, preserved, authoritative Word of God, or we don't. Those are the only two possibilities. If we have the inspired, preserved, authoritative Word of God, Islam is false, because Islam contradicts what we have. If we don't have the inspired, preserved, authoritative Word of God, Islam is false, because the Quran affirms the inspiration, preservation, and authority of our book. So if the Gospel is the Word of God, Islam is false. If the Gospel isn't the Word of God, Islam is false. Either way, Islam is false. By affirming scriptures that contradict its core teachings, Islam self-destructs. Muslims who don't want to believe in a religion that self-destructs will therefore need to find a new religion. Let's encourage our Muslim friends to obey the gospel as both of our religions command. So there's, yeah, just the, the authenticity of the Bible. Um, <coughs> we don't quite understand when it could have been corrupted, um, because it spread through all the world, uh, or Asia, Africa, and Europe, with no evidence of change in up to 600 AD. And we have manuscripts from which still exist from very old times, <laughs> um, dating back to the second century, but four copies from the fourth and and 5th century, um, and if it was so, Jewish or Christian converts that convert, would have converted, may have converted to Islam um, would have been able to retain their original texts because the, the Quran reveres the Torah and the Bible, um, so there's no reason why they could, should have changed. Um, practically, we don't quite understand how someone could have gone all over the world to collect all the different copies, um, because currently there is very little indifference between different copies, so how they would have changed them practically um, is not understood. And why? Like, if, if God could preserve the Quran, and the word of the Quran is not changed, why would he change the Gospel if it's revered? just doesn't make sense. Um, yeah, so in literature, like the book, the Bible is, is like exalted um, as such a, such a beautiful sort of um, book of books, because uh, it has like 40 authors, it spans over 16 centuries, um, but ultimately then we know there is just one author because there is this beautiful unity throughout all the books. Um, throughout, for example, um, oldest book in the Bible, everybody? 
Genesis. It's been mentioned a couple of times. What's well, thought to be one of the oldest books mentioned today a couple of times. Sure. Yeah, Job. Um, even from like the Book of Job has so much, and it refers to, to stuff in today. Like the Bible is not outdated. Um, talks about equality of the, of the sexes. Talks about resurrection. Um, talks about science. Like it's just it's pretty cool. Um, the only differences in, in manuscripts um, were sort of stylistical differences um, in translation, but the he Greek and Hebrew versions were like there. There is no. There is no difference. Um, we mentioned that. Yeah, these are just a couple of the, um, of the early manuscripts which we can find. Um, so if you go to the British Museum in London, you can find the Codex Sinaiticus, which is from the 4th century. Um, and then the Codex Vaticanus <coughs> is in the Vatican Library. Um, I can't remember where the other one's from. I apologise. Um, but on top of that, we have Dead Sea Scrolls, um, which are even older and um, things called Masoretic texts, which are, if I can find it, Sarah? Oops. Ah, oh, here they are. It's basically what um, they held as the Old Testament. It's basically what Jews have, but they possess the original Hebrew language in the Old Testament, and it goes back to a thousand years. So it's, it's those who revere the Old Testament scripture as well. Um, affirming consistency with the, the Bible that we have today. And then you've got the Septuagint, which is the first translation of the Old Testament into Greek, transcribed in the second century, and it again contains all the prophecies. So it's quite, got quite a few um, documents. Um, and the original Greek New Testament survives as early as the second century after Christ. Um, just that's it guys, we just wanted to sing the song, but also just a word about the Trinity again. Um, Abuna was telling me yesterday how, you know how we read the verse in Genesis that says, let us make man in our image. Um, even though it says we in our, it's quite complex, but the Hebrew word doesn't actually have a plural. Um, so it doesn't express them as three separate beings. I think I heard something like it's kind of more to, like like kings and queens sometimes use it like in honor like our our image like just based yeah. on in, in the Hebrew language the use of the royal we does not exist so when they used the we the, the, the royal we was the first time it was used in the language while it's not existing before that for kings or for glorification so it was meant to be for a plural, okay? There is no other explanation for it being the we, the, 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 the plural. Um, and really, really, really quickly, um, I just wanted to say something about Trinity as well. It's like theology and love. We were talking about it being some this sort of like love dance. I just wanted to mention the Gospel of St. John. We refer to it as the gospel of love, but we also refer to it as the gospel with the like the most theological um, and tackles the Trinity. And the more we understand about um, the Trinity, the more we understand that we learn God's love. And then the more we understand God's love, the more we understand about the Trinity.